Hi, I'm Petey, and this is my playhouse. Welcome to attempt number 10 of this. I don't know. Uh, that's why my voice might sound a little strange to you right now, so I apologize for that. Uh, I've run on, into all kinds of issues for some reason. Of just trying to do this simple little quick video that's not going to, you know, it's not going to involve a lot of editing and those kinds of things, but for whatever reason, technical problems arose, arose, and so I've had to do this many times. Hopefully this is it. Uh, speaking of issues, so <clears throat> this video was originally going to be finally my first major book review, and it was going to be a Robert Conquest, The Great Terror. That is still coming. I just have to delay that video a little bit longer because I've had, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, creating an opening sequence for all my book review films and that has just taken me much longer than anticipated ran into some stuff had to do a lot of trial and error reconceptualizations anyways those of you who do this kind of thing know what i'm talking about so, so that's one reason i'm doing this video I, I just want to go ahead and get something out there while i'm still dealing with that it's almost there though i just got some tweaks left to do for that opening and then i can put together the <clears throat> the actual first review so i want to get this up just have something in the meantime. And two, uh, I've had several people, okay, really two or three of you, ask me to follow up on the Oppenheimer stuff, especially since I've now seen the movie. I've seen it twice, actually. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, given the previous ten versions or ten attempts of this, I, I know that each time I've gone on longer than I really want to, so let me try to be quick. If I can get this under at least 10 minutes, it's probably not going to happen. And by the way, uh, largely unscripted, right? Aside from I know what I want to say and because I've tried this thing 10 times or whatever. So, a little rambling here. Um, it's not as structured as my actual book reviews will be. So, so um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, let's do this. First off, what did I think of the movie overall? I liked the movie. I took a little more the second time I saw it, but ultimately I could not fall in love with the film. And I was hoping that would be the case, especially the second time I went to see it, because in the past I've had this happen to me where I've gone and seen a movie, liked it, but for some reason something about it just didn't take. So I went and gave it another chance, and then lo and behold, boom, I, I fall in love with it. I was hoping that would happen here, especially because I was aware you know, of the misgivings I was going to have about it the second time around. But alas, I did not, still didn't fall in love with it. And I think most of that has to do with, uh, well, hold on, I'll get there, okay. So, uh, I did like, so uh, this is supposed to be about <laughs> what I liked about the movie. So the movie, uh, it's very entertaining. I never felt like it was three hours long both times I saw it. A lot of impressive things. I mean, you're going to get, generally in any Christopher Nolan film, some sort of big, uh, impressive physical set piece, like the the train, train, plane crash in Tenet, his last movie, or, you know, the overturning of the semi in The Dark Knight. And you get that here with the Trinity testing. This is the best part of the movie uh, for me, both times I saw it. Uh, and it is very impressive. It's one of the most... I mean, it's one of the best things I think that at least Christopher Nolan has put on film. Uh, and there's a lot of great acting here. Um, a lot of names. <laughs> Seems like just about every uh, A-list Hollywood person is in this. So so most of the acting is very good. Uh, <clears throat> I, yeah, so I, you know, pretty much, I think for me, I'm going to be entertained by just about any Christopher Nolan film I've seen, maybe apart from Insomnia. All right, so uh, so overall, this is good. It's competently made. A lot of amazing visual things that are going on. A lot of interesting cinematic choices. Maybe some of those choices were, on occasion, borderline, self-indulgent, masturbatory. And I think in the end, for me, it's pretty clear that I personally think, oops, I personally think Christopher Nolan is better when he's got his brother Jonathan Nolan working with him. Because now we have three films where it's just been Christopher Nolan, Oppenheimer, Tenet, and Dunkirk, and I, th for me, I just think that it seems like his brother is a, at least a moderating or constraining influence on, on Christopher Nolan. 
Okay, so uh, that's the good. So what are my issues? Well, one of those should be obvious if you did watch my sort of book review of the two Oppenheimer biographies. Bottom line is that this is just based on the biography of Oppenheimer I do not like, didn't care for. That's American Prometheus by Byrd and Sherwin. And for better or worse, for worse for me, this is the uh, biography that Nolan based his movie, his script on. So he's very much taking his cue from their book. So what does that mean? Well, that means certain, certain of my fears were well-founded. The science or the scientific aspects of Oppenheimer very much get marginalized. That's because they do so in that biography. So they do so here. Uh, it's not to say that, you know... Let me say this. So it's not just that Oppenheimer as a scientist gets, you know, pushed aside here uh, to pursue other <coughs> other aspects of Oppenheimer's life, to emphasize these other aspects. But just, for instance, the interesting scientific engineering, you know, trial and error stuff that they went through at Los Alamos. I mean, there's a smidgen of that in the film, but not to any kind of satisfying degree. So... And so, so the other big thing about no one using uh, the Burton Sherwin piece is that you end up with more of a political uh, thriller, okay, not really thriller, uh, political drama. And that's because Burton Sherwin pretty much make everything out to be about the 1954 security hearing, and that's what the movie does, right? So that that is the framing device that's used in the film. And in fact, I don't have so much of an issue with using the 1954 security hearing as a framing device it actually makes sense but there's using that as a framing device and then there's making everything out to be about that and as if everything in Oppenheimer's life was leading to this point right this period of political persecution uh, so I just so again in the end I wished I at least wish if Oppenheimer what I wish Oppenheimer oh, sorry what I wish no one would have done was looked at several Oppenheimer biographies and then kind of constructed his own instead of just using the American Prometheus one. Um, anyways, so, right, problem number one is just based on the wrong biography. Problem two, and in all the previous attempts at this, I've gone too long on this point, so I'm going to be quick this time. The black and white segment, so, for those of you who've seen, I should have said spoilers, right? Spoilers, because I got to, especially I got to talk about the ending in, 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 in just a minute. The way this is constructed is the colorized, colorized segments are from Oppenheimer's point of view, the black and white are from this Louis Strauss character. The black and white segments, uh, I can't, I don't like much of the black and white segments because, as and, and it's frustrating because Robert Downey Jr. is great here. His acting is great. And he may even get, you know, uh, an Oscar nomination out of this. And I wouldn't have any problem with that, except this segment is very speculative. I mean, there are some factual things that are there, but it's very speculative. Some things are just made up out of whole cloth, like Oppenheimer being the reason that Strauss failed at his confirmation hearing. Had nothing to do with it. Um, it's it's too much. For, the main thing is I don't like how demonized Strauss. And I get it. You needed a villain. And it's probably Bird and Sherwin. If you remember, I abandoned the Bird and Sherwin halfway through. So maybe in that part of the book, they, they make out <sighs> Strauss to be this villain. And so Oppenheimer's just, I mean, I keep saying Oppenheimer, knowing this follows that, right? So anyways, I, it's too much for me. Uh, it's possible. Strauss is motivated by, you know, this personal animosity towards Oppenheimer scientists in general because it's perceived snubbing, but we don't know that. That's speculative, okay? Uh, whether Strauss was acting in good faith or bad faith when he when he sort of put things in motion to have the security hearing happen, we don't know, okay? And it's just, it really is pure speculation to put forward this really, to me, too much of a caricatured villain, okay, which is what you get with a Strauss character. Uh, oh, that, okay, and then and then security hearing stuff, so back to kind of point one. So I, also the thing about security hearing is something you need to know is that uh, the movie plays it off, plays the security hearing as if it's a full-on McCarthyite hearing, which is frustrating because the movie itself acknowledges that it's not what it was supposed to be, 
because uh, McCarthy and McCarthy idea, McCarthyism is in decline at this point. They didn't want McCarthy to touch this, right? And yet, in the end, it's played on. It's played as if it is a full-on McCarthyite hearing, and it was not that. Like, for example, Kitty's brought up, uh, Oppenheimer's wife is brought up to talk about her communist past and all of this stuff. That did not happen. Would have happened had it been an actual McCarthyite thing, but it wasn't. It wasn't that at all? And look, and I don't mean to diminish what Oppenheimer had to go through at this hearing. Okay. Uh, so, anyways, all right. Final point here. My, my final problem has to do with the ending. And so the ending is uh, Oppenheimer comes to Einstein, says, hey, remember, I came to you before. I'll talk about uh, talk about that in a second. And said, look, we got these troubling calculations that <clears throat> suggest the chain reaction will never stop once we detonate the first atom bomb, okay, ignite the atmosphere, early destruction of the planet. And then, you know, Oppenheimer is like, hey, uh, turns out, I think we did start a chain reaction that will lead to the destruction of the planet, right? In this case, now the chain reaction being nuclear proliferation and then potential for nuclear warfare, right? Uh, nuclear holocaust, I should say. <clears throat> uh, I mean, the end is the end is functioning also to uh, contrast, <laughs> you know, this existential worry about nuclear annihilation versus the personal snubbing of of, uh, of uh, straws, right, and, and to really highlight the triviality of that compared to nuclear annihilation of the planet. So it's it's functioning, the end is functioning in, in that way too. But okay, so 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 that ending depends on an earlier scene where Oppenheimer learns that one of the scientists working at Los Alamos, Edward Teller. Also, one of the minds behind the super, the, the hydrogen bomb, does these calculations, and these calculations seem to su suggest that there's a real possibility when they detonate the bomb, chain reaction won't stop; it'll ignite the atmosphere, destroy the planet. So, in the movie, rightly, Hans Bethe, this did happen. Okay, this is what happened. Hans Bethe looked at these calculations, and determined, oh, we got several assumptions here that are unfounded. Once we address these assumptions, then the then the calculations now. Uh, the possibility of that is now not zero, but at least almost, you know, next to zero. <sighs> um, <clears throat> but in the film, even though that's there, what's also there is before that happens, you have Oppenheimer traveling across the country from the West Coast to the East Coast to meet with Einstein and, and ask him to double check these calculations. Okay, so here's my here's my thing, is that Okay, well, these two scenes never happen, you know, these meetings, and it's not, my issue isn't necessarily that they're fabricated, okay? One of my favorites, let me give you an example here, one of my favorite scenes in the film is completely fabricated, and that's the, uh, that's the <clears throat> scene between Oppenheimer and Groves just before the Trinity testing about this very issue, okay? Because Groves over here is Fermi taking bets on whether the atmosphere is going to ignite, like Taylor's original calculation suggested, and Groves, right, rightly, is sort of worried about this, asks Oppenheimer about this, and Oppenheimer says, well, yeah, this was an early worry we had, but it's okay because it turns out the chances of this happening are near zero, and Groves responds with, near zero, I need it to be zero, and Oppenheimer says, what do you want from theory alone? It's a great scene. I love this scene. It's one of my favorite scenes in the film, but it's wholly made up. Uh, uh, however... The thing about that scene is that you can, it's conceivable that something like that conversation would have happened between Oppenheimer and Groves at some point, okay? It's not out of the bounds of reality when you know about that situation, Oppenheimer and Groves. Whereas Oppenheimer and Einstein, the problem here is there would have been no reason at all for Oppenheimer to travel across the country and have Einstein check these calculations. Okay? So the problem one right there, especially when you had people like Hans Bethe, who eventually did show, right, the problems with Teller's assumptions. So, one, and then, you know, Oppenheimer was famously dismissive of Einstein. Uh, I mean, they were cordial, and it's not like he didn't meet with him from time to time. He did, you know, one of those things is in the movie when he goes to him about the security hearing, that did happen. But he would not have, you know, uh, uh, sought out 
the advice of Einstein over this because he was, again, dismissive of Einstein, and that's due to Einstein's continued intrinsic opposition to quantum mechanics, something that the film rightly shows, you know, the Oppenheimer responsible for bringing to the United States. Uh, and also, you know, he didn't think Einstein had done any interesting science in the past 20 years. So all that to say, the problem here is that th that's not even within the bounds of conceivability that Oppenheimer would have done this, okay? Gone across the country, seen Einstein, tried to get him to check these calculations. So I can't buy into that first scene. And the thing is, that first scene only exists, okay, to set up the last scene, the final scene. And so if I can't buy this first scene, well, I can't buy the, the last scene, the scene that ends the movie, and well, if I can't buy that scene, I can't buy the ending of the film. And I think that's a big reason, ultimately, why I can't find, I can't find a way to love the movie like I want to. Now, look, I know some of you are going to be like, ah, what is this? It's not a big deal. And I know, in some sense, you're right. You know, talking with a friend about this, he made an interesting point that the way he likes to do this is to be in, entertained and then enlightened. You know, see a movie about someone and then, like, maybe check up on it. I have this problem where I tend to want to do the opposite. I want to be enlightened and then entertained, but then I end up being disappointed because the entertaining part doesn't live up to the expectations I get out of the enlightenment process. And it's just something I'm cursed with, I think, you know. Um, uh, and so, anyway, and so, I, I, so I get it. If you think if I'm making too much out of this here, you know, I understand that. But for me, personally... It's too big of a thing. I can't overcome it. I wish I could overcome it and love the movie, and I can't. All that being said, I would still recommend seeing the film, which, if you watch this, you know, I really did spoil it. So, uh, even if, but if I did spoil it for you, I would still recommend going and seeing the movie. And honestly, I wouldn't even be upset if it won, like, Best Picture, because it's kind of time for Nolan to get that kind of recognition, I think. All right, so that's it. This still went longer than I wanted. I'm sorry. Uh, next video, I promise, will be the actual first book review, complete with an opening sequence and an ending sequence as well. All right, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, thanks for listening to me ramble. Those are my thoughts about the film Oppenheimer versus the history of Oppenheimer. And all right, I'll be seeing you.